So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for joining uh, us for our webinar. Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the two MSCs uh, that we're launching in the Development Studies Department at SOAS. Uh, one is the MSC in International Development, and the other is the MSC in Humanitarian Action. I've been watching the names of people logging in, and I've certainly seen some names that I recognize from the applications that I've seen coming through. So it's really great to see you. Welcome. Uh, to you. Welcome to everyone else, those who are interested in the program, those who have already applied and been accepted to the program. Uh, it's a time to discuss, to, to know what the details of the program are, uh, and for me to present a little bit about the way that we'll be teaching. Uh, the first thing to point out is that we're launching these two online programs for reasons of, um, of wanting to include more people in the pro master's programs that we offer. So at the moment, our programs are all in the Development Studies Department, our programs are all on campus. This means that people have to leave their jobs, uh, maybe move to London, and commit to full-time or part-time study. Um, the, the idea of the online programs is that we'll be able to cast that net further and that we'll be able to build, build up even more diverse groups and discussions uh, to look at these issues of humanitarian action and international development. So we started from these principles, the, the SOAS ethos of progressive critical thinking and development studies. Uh, and the pedagogy of distance learning is, is designed to be inclusive, to be accessible, to be user friendly and flexible. Uh, and then we are sharing this ethos and design and pedagogy with the University of London. So the degrees uh, are run through the University of London uh, itself. This, when we say flexible and accessible, it means that we're expecting that students will be able to study at the same time as, as keeping going with their uh, caring responsibilities, their professional responsibilities, uh, and that they're not expected to come to London at any stage in their degree. The whole program is uh, delivered online. It's not um, delivered at a particular point of time. There are ongoing discussions that you can contribute to when your work or caring um, responsibilities permit. So we're expecting a long-term uh, discussion between people in different parts of the world who have different kinds of uh, schedules and, and timings. If we move first of all to the, the uh, I should say at the beginning, I should say now, uh, if you have any questions as I can, please feel free to, to type them into the little box on the right hand side, that will pop up uh, and I'll be able to answer those questions as we go through. So as you probably already know, there are two um, two programs that we're launching. These are our first two distance learning programs. The distance learning MSc in international development draws on an already established 20 year history of the development studies department. We've been training uh, on, on campus MSc students uh, for about 20 years. And we have a reputation as being uh, a department that takes a critical view of uh, development studies and also looks for progressive kinds of solutions. So we have a mainstream. Uh, that, that which is presented in uh, development policy and a lot of development implementation. And then we have a, a critique of that, which is um, brought from a predominantly a political economy perspective. And then we look to see what kinds of uh, ways can be employed in order to improve the way that development is conceptualized, theorized uh, and practiced in real world uh, examples. So we're looking at a thorough and interdisciplinary and analytical understanding of processes of change in developing regions, a specialized knowledge of particular case studies as well as overall trends, skills to think uh, in politically relevant terms, and analytical skills and understandings of practical methodologies to proceed to professional employment and or PhD research. So we see the MSc as part of a journey, a professional uh, journey, to better understand the processes of development in which we are involved. The schedule, oh sorry, this is the core module. The, 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 the program is based on a core module. This is something that gives you, gives you the, um, the key uh, principles and theories of the development program. So we start off with a battle of ideas in development, uh, looking at ways of imposing uh, and inventing development, looking at, at development as neoclassical Marxist or as structural economics. We look at development as neoliberalism, good governance uh, state, or the new institutionalism. We look at processes of contesting development, alternative development, post-development, and decolonization. And in the contesting development uh, 
from the contesting development perspective, the human and sustainable development paradigm. So we take a whole body of political literature that has shaped the way that we think about what development is, how development takes place, what power is involved, uh, and how changes are made within those systems and structures of power. Within uh, the way that we think about development, we have always the question of whose development, who is being, uh, whose interests are being forwarded, what power is, is, is involved in forwarding those interests. So we look at the way that development can be measured uh, from uh, utilitarian to multi-dimensional um, multi perspectives. We look at poverty and inequality uh, the, the, at international and national levels and gender within the development paradigm. And then we use uh, these kinds of ways of thinking, these theories, to look at the way that uh, development uh, is, shapes nation states and globalization. And looking at the way that all of these processes are brought together gives a, an overall perspective of the processes of development uh, that can be, can be measured, can be analyzed, and then can be um, used to improve uh, policy, whether that's uh, non-governmental organization policy, uh, governmental policy, um, or, or analytical uh, and theoretical contributions. The structure of the develop international development um, international Development Programme has called the Political Economy and Sociology of Development. That's the slide that I've just been presenting. So those are the kind of key debates that shape the programme. Uh, and then um, that, that module is taken first, and that, that is a compulsory part of the programme. Then you move towards two guided development studies modules, which are taken either in the development studies department or that relate to development that are taught in other parts of SOAS. And one of the things that is um, commendable about these programs is that we've, we've maximized the collaboration across SOAS to allow people to select the modules that they need that will best serve their intellectual and professional interests. So there are four modules that are taken over the course of the two-year program. And then it, this culminates in a, a 60 credit development studies uh, dissertation. Now that dissertation is not done in one gulp. Uh, what happens is that between the modules there are structured moments in which uh, the dissertation skills are taught. So first of all you're encouraged to find your dissertation topic, what kind of research question you'd like to address, uh, then you are um, then, then you have a, mo a, a research module that looks at developing a reading list, um, and then, then you have a, a, develop, a research module that looks at building up your disciplinary and, uh, and analytical arguments. And then finally, when you get to write the dissertation, you already have the majority of the work done uh, and the dissertation more or less is able to write itself. So this dissertation is 60 credits uh, and the modules are 30 credits. So this means the dissertation uh, carries more weight and that is where you're going towards. This is the, the kind of prize of your uh, MSc program, uh, an independent piece of research on a subject that you find uh, to be of particular significance within the field of international development. And that subject can be pretty much anything that concerns international development. You can talk about the, the parameters of your project with your supervisor, what kind of a project makes a good research question, what kinds of data are going to be available to you, what forms of analysis you will be um, putting onto that data. And that will mean that by the end of your, your program, you have a, a, a document, a 10,000 word document, which is uh, kind of broadly equivalent to, to a, a book chapter or an article in a journal that is of your own uh, independent research and your own analytical argument. So when, when choosing your credits, I think one of the, the key things to consider is what intellectual tools you need in order to carry out that research. If you have any idea at the beginning of the program what you'd like to write your dissertation on, make sure you get the modules you need. Do you need to know about human security? Do you know, need to know about gender? Do you need to know about migration? If you do, then make sure that you take the modules in those topics in order to equip yourself intellectually with all the tools that you need in order to carry out the, um, the research for your dissertation. If we move now to the uh, distance learning MSc in humanitarian action, uh, whilst the, the international development um, 
draws very much on the established reputation of the department, the Department of Studies Department, the humanitarian action is, is more of a, of a growth area for us. And it's something that we're, um, we are designing in order to draw from the students across the school, not only in SOAS. And we uh, have the privilege of having um, Baroness Valerie Amos as our director. And she has um, an, uh, uh, a reputation in the humanitarian world from her work uh, with OPTA in the United Nations uh, and also whilst working with the Brit British government. So we have, um, within the school, across to say across the school, a huge wealth of experience, professional experience and academic expertise in humanitarian action. And we're, just, we're bringing that together in order to inform uh, this new MSc in humanitarian action. Um, both degrees, I should say, are designed for people who are wanting to work in these areas. Of course, it's absolutely fine if you want to take a master's degree to improve yourself for, for, for your personal interests or study. But all, both of them are also uh, designed in order to move people from maybe from one line of work into another line of work from or from one level of work into a higher level of policy making or analysis or research. So we do expect the degrees to be professionally helpful to, uh, to you in your, in your career progression. So I've had one question here uh, about the dissertation. Are all 60 credits in the final dissertation or is it split between the proposal and the final written dissertation? And the answer is that the, the, the mark of the dissertation goes to the final product of the dissertation. And before that, you'll receive feedback from your supervisor, which will, um, which will guide the way that you take your dissertation forward. So the humanitarian action degree, uh, a thorough an interdisciplinary analytical understanding of humanitarian action, a specialised knowledge of particular case studies as well as overall trends, skills to think in politically relevant, uh, policy relevant terms, and analytical skills and understanding of practical methodologies to, to proceed to professional employment and or PhD research. Now there's one uh, point that quite often comes up in conversations about SOAS and that's about the reach of our organisation, the reach of the university, because it's associated very strongly with research in Africa, Asia and the Middle East, which is where a lot of our expertise uh, lies. But I would stress also that in the Development Studies Department, we have people who work on Latin America, we have people who work on, on globalisation, which of course involves all areas of the world. Uh, and we've had people who work in Eastern Europe as well. So we don't have, well, we do have a, a, a clear uh, expertise in Africa, Asia and the Middle East. We do also uh, work on, and colleagues do work on other areas of the world and on international issues. And I think that's really worth stating both with regard to the international development degree and with regard to humanitarian action. It's not that we are looking only at humanitarian action as it operates in, on the African continent, for example, we we will be looking also at um, issues of migration across the Mediterranean, issues of of humanitarianism within Europe. Um, so the core module, as I, I look through the core module of the international development degree, the core module of the humanitarian action degree is called, called humanitarian principles and practice, and this sets out uh, the key areas of humanitarian study, which are the, the humanitarian principles, uh, the history of humanitarian humanitarianism and principles, uh, needs assessment, early warning, evaluation and monitoring. These are the nuts and bolts of how it is that humanitarianism uh, is practiced, how humanitarian organizations operate uh, and what kinds of um, perspectives they take on um, measuring humanitarian need. Secondly, the architecture. How is it that humanitarian uh, organizations operate uh, between themselves and with the states in which, they're, um, in which they're working and with host populations? So how is power negotiated in humanitarian crises? Whose agenda is forwarded through humanitarianism? We look at permanent and complex emergencies. This is something that uh, came to humanitarianism kind of after the end of the Cold War, the idea that an emergency is not necessarily something that takes place at a particular moment in time, but actually can continue uh, in emergency conditions for, for generations uh, and sometimes. We will also look at the interests and power from the global south. This is a voice that is very often missing from humanitarian debates, or I should say a set of voices that is very 
often missing from humanitarian debates, the idea of an emergency, uh, an emergency that can be described in, in, um, in terms of numbers and areas affected is very much counter to the experience of many people living uh, in those areas in that they see uh, layers of, of different forms of insecurity and violence that affect them at different periods of time and sometimes become critical. Uh, so we're looking to, to, to see what authors uh, are, are writing from the Global South, but also to include other forms of, of uh, reading. So we'll be looking uh, at activist voices and blogs and that sort of thing from the Global South, from people who are involved either in humanitarian crises or in responding to those humanitarian crises. And we'll also be looking at remittances and resilience and the idea that people have uh, people who suffer from humanitarian crises have all sorts of other ways of surviving not just through the provision of humanitarian aid they have maybe uh, relatives who are living abroad and are able to send money into the areas that have been affected by crisis or disaster they may have ways of operating within the community or, or regionally that will mitigate the effects of the disaster so instead of looking only at a kind of provision model of the north, the global north uh, intervening in the global south, we look at how it is that people manage the opportunities and the risks um, that are um, presenting to them. Okay, so I've got a couple of questions uh, coming up here. How much is the MSC humanitarian action and what's the cost length? So all of the, the prices can be found on the website. Um, one of the, the characteristics of these online courses is that it's possible to play in installments. So if you're, um, if you're trying to plan what your outgoings will be uh, with, your, with your studies, then um, look at the possibility of playing, paying, I mean, the possibility is there to pay in installments that you pay for each module as you go through. Uh, and the course lasts for two years, so it's basically two-year part-time study um, and under some circumstances it can be um, achieved in slightly less than that, but the, the, normal, the norm is to have a two-year study. It is possible, having said that, to take some time out and come back to the course. So again, going back to the idea of flexibility that I talked about at the beginning of the programme, we want to make the programmes fit around people's commitments uh, and ensure that, that people are able to take what they need at the moment that they need in order to move forward with their studies. Can you, so I've got a question here, can you clarify the difference uh, definitions between the international development um, and humanitarian action? I sort of see them on a continuum but just wondering how you the school have drawn the line to distinguish them. The programs seem to be very similar with the exception of the core module. Now that that's true, uh, I'd say the core module um, the way that you choose your electives and your dissertation will be what characterizes your um, your program. So it, it's true that um, the core module is is what kind of uniquely identifies it. Um, but then, if you're moving, to the, if you're moving, if you see the program always as looking towards the dissertation, what will your dissertation topic be? The the scope of international development uh, is not usually um, concerned with issues like war, crisis, environmental catastrophe, um, famine, migration. These are things that are kind of a little bit, they may be part of the development discussion, but, but to focus entirely on those uh, kinds of topics will be more on the humanitarian action side. And also the responses that are made to those kinds of actions, uh, those kinds of uh, crises. So humanitarian action is very much about the interaction between the crisis and the response that is given to it. Uh, so if you were to be interested, for example, in um, the, the responses that are, that are given to um, malnutrition in South Sudan, that would be a dissertation that is more suited to the humanitarian action uh, program. And you would take your electives in order to know uh, regionally about South Sudan, to know about uh, nutrition, to know about um, humanitarian assistance. If you were to look at the state formation of South Sudan, you'd be more inclined to take the international development uh, program and learn about state formation, learn about democratization, learn about the interaction between development and conflict. And that will take you towards a dissertation that can look at processes of state formation, albeit in very violent um, conditions, which may amount at some moments to humanitarian disaster.
Um, but you, you're right in terms of the, the pattern of it on the on the on the face of it, it does look like they're very similar. But in terms of the kinds of uh, electives, similarly the electives, there's an elective, for example, on um, critical and human security. I would imagine that would be taken more by people who are taking the humanitarian action program than by people who are taking the humanitarian, so the international development. And if you were to take humanitarian action, migration, international security, uh, and um, let's say uh, the environment. Then that would be very much different kind of a program to somebody who was taking international development, um, gender, um, civil society, um, and political economy, something along those lines. So, so it's the combination and the dissertation that also gives some characteristic to each of the programs. Um, so, I've got another question here. Hi, Zoe, I have two questions. How many hours of study per week should we expect for the MSc in international development? If we can do the course in two years, and two, can we complete the course in one year if we do it full time? So, um, in terms of hours of study, um, we work on the basis that you'll spend about 10, 10 to 15 hours of study. That having been said per week, that having been said, of course, there's going to be some weeks that interest you more, uh, some weeks that interest you less. So, how much you actually study is going to be very much down to you and where you want to take your your um, studying. The weeks that you have an assignment due or that you're working out to an assignment clearly will be kind of more heavily invested than the weeks maybe at the beginning of the course which are more light touch and quite a lot of getting to know each other in the group and that sort of thing so there'll be some variation you'll be able to um take control of your own time as well in that if if you see uh, a deadline coming up in 10 weeks time you can know that you either will be able to put more time in towards the end or that you need to get it uh, started a little bit earlier there are also um, gaps between the between the modules. So you take the first module, then there's a little gap, uh, and there's a research element there as well. So it's not that you have to do 10 or 15 hours a week throughout the year. There's only two full taught modules in each year. You cannot do it um, one year um, full time. That's because, I mean, the main reason for that is that you have to pass the core module before passing on to the rest of the degree. So that module you have to take by itself. It is possible once you pass the core module to kind of accelerate a little bit in the way that you're doing it uh, and start to take some modules uh, side by side. So that means that the, the quickest it's possible to take uh, the course in is one year and a half. So how many students are expected to be in the first cohort? So that is um, a question that is quite to answer but also it may not be relevant because the way that the uh, program is taught is that uh, the, the discussion in seminar groups is is limited to a capacity of 15 per group so you'll get to know the people in your seminar group but won't necessarily get to know the people in the rest of the people in your, your cohort until you go on and take other electives where you might overlap with them hello <laughs> hello to people who are saying hello that's quite sweet um Nonetheless, I seem to be losing a little strength. Okay, can I ask, for the international development, uh, what is the difference between the two guided modules and the two and the elective modules? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. It's something that, in all honesty, is not quite clear on the website, so I'll explain it now, which is to say that we, we are encouraging people to take two modules within the development studies department, or rather, we're insisting that people take modules in the in the area of development studies, but because we're doing this across SOAS, there are some modules that are taught outside of the development studies department that also count as modules. Those, particularly those that are taught by CDEP, so on environment, for example, uh, and climate change, those modules count as development studies modules. So, though anything that sounds a bit developmenty is what we call a guided module. And the other one can be completely free, so you can talk, take something in international dipl diplomacy, or something that has very little to do uh, with development. Uh, and that's the, the kind of open elective module. Um, will there be set assignment questions for each module, or will students be expected to develop their own questions, not including the session? And if questions are set, are they provided at the start of the course? So, we'll have full term. so yes, uh, there are set questions uh, and they're provided at the beginning of the term. So exactly that, you get the whole term to work towards um, one of the, the questions. And the, the um, inquiry that I, asked, I answered a couple of minutes ago about how much time you expected to each week, the week that you choose for your 
topic, the topic of your essay is clearly going to be the week that you invest most, and you may find yourself doing some readings for that week, you know, in another week before or afterwards, uh, and that's that's the reason that you may not have exactly the name, same number of hours of study each week. Yeah, and I, your brackets not including the dissertation, that's absolutely right, that, that it's you, your, you, the student who sorts out your research question in consultation with your supervisor. So when it comes to the dissertation, you have a free hand in terms of choosing your area of study. What are the real requirements to in, attend this course? Um, all of the requirements are on the face uh, on the Facebook or on the internet uh, on the website for for the department. So you can see under the two pages concerning these two courses what what the requirements are. We're looking essentially for a first degree uh, in a relevant subject. Nonetheless, we understand people are using the program to change from one subject to another subject. So if if their so their personal statement, their supporting statement, um, is able to convince us that this that they're prepared intellectually to take a degree of this nature, then we will take into account things like personal ex uh, professional experience and, and other sorts of uh, academic or, or uh, professional training that you've had. Um, do you have do you have any faculty with experience or focus on development in the Pacific? Or some experience with the region. So we don't. I don't think we have anybody who works particularly uh, with the with the Pacific region. Uh, but in a sense, that's um, not a problem. I mean, in no sense is it a problem. In that uh, the dissertation supervision is provided as much on the basis of disciplinary uh, overlap as it is with geographical overlap. And the reason I say that is uh, we have. Um, how many people in the faculty? Maybe 25. Uh, there's no way that we can cover all parts of the world, but there is a way in which we can cover all dissertations that are on relevant subjects because we are able to, to link up thematic um, overlaps between students and supervisors or disciplinary overlaps. So if you want to write from an anthropological perspective or from a political science perspective, there will be somebody who can guide you in terms of how to structure a dissertation, what kinds of uh, approaches to say what kinds of literature to be consulting um, and and the geographical overlap can be helpful but also I don't think it's necessarily uh, uh, a prerequisite to to supervision I'll just um, there seems to be a little bit of a pause on the questions return to the humanitarian principles um, this is actually the junior um, and practice this is the, the juiciest part the third part is really the juiciest part in terms of explaining how it is that uh, humanitarianism, humanitarian action continues to take place despite the sorts of weaknesses and failings that his demonstrators have in the past. So we'll be looking at what critiques have been made of humanitarian action. I think, I mean, clearly amongst them are questions of accountability and and responsibility. Uh, also questions of, of colo colonial history, who is, whose disaster is this, who is intervening, who is being assisted, how those sorts of things impact. Um, and then meeting these critiques and, and an expl explanation of the longevity of humanitarian action. I think there's something very kind of political and also emotional that is being uh, performed in the giving of humanitarian assistance. These kinds of um, dichotomies that humanitarian action sets up. So we have the, the question of security that has become very significant in issues of humanitarian action in the last 10 years or so, particularly with increased some humanitarian workers uh, in Afghanistan and some other uh, some other places, the complete failure of humanitarian action in areas that were held by the so-called Islamic State in northern uh, Iraq and Syria, and also the complete failure of humanitarian action in Yemen. And we have to take those kinds of failures very seriously when looking forward in humanitarian action. How is it that it is possible to intervene in these spaces that have become very, very much more hostile? To humanitarian workers uh, operating there. So the idea of, of security uh, for humanitarian workers has been married with the idea of remoteness and the use of technology to gauge needs, to gauge ass uh, assessment, uh, and to gauge who is receiving what, how successful it was as, as an intervention, and what kinds of outcomes that it had. Another kind of dichotomy is set up by the questions of, of uh, responsibility to protect, that's R R2P, and sovereignty. So sovereignty being um, the government's um, right to, to, to govern the territory without interference, 
uh, which comes into conflict with the idea of responsibility to protect once this once that responsibility passed from like once it's been deemed that the government is not protecting its population responsibility passes to the united nations or to other interested uh, parties and that is clearly uh, a derogation of, of sovereignty so how do we see those things as working together and then uh, two two more kind of little dichotomies that are set up, set up. One is the idea of witness versus access, and this is something that the ICRC, a kind of veritable uh, humanitarian organisation with an extremely long history, has always um, has always tackled the idea of getting access to people in order to to um, serve their humanitarian needs, their basic needs, their needs as human beings, uh, and what what kinds of compromises are uh, established in that process. And then other organizations and, and MSF would be an example under some circumstances prefer instead to bear witness to say, look, these abuses are taking place. We can't stand by and simply bring in uh, food for, for populations if they're being attacked um, by government troops. And then finally, another, the, finally the, the, the dichotomy that is established between relief and asylum. For a long time, humanitarian action has been given in uh, places that are remote from from where the humanitarian aid originates. So to put it in concrete terms, uh, aid is, uh, originates in the north and has been largely given on the continent of Africa. Now we're, now we're looking at humanitarian uh, contexts that span continents that, that um, provide, uh, that present humanitarian conditions, for example, on Greek islands when, when the migrants have come from uh, Syria or from or across the Mediterranean. And those people are being given humanitarian assistance when what they want is actually asylum. So humanitarian assistance becomes something of a palliative to those people whose actual needs uh, are much more um, politically based, security based, and are not served simply by being given the kind of bare minimum that is needed for survival. And I think the, um, the new challenges that are facing humanitarian organizations in Europe uh, as a result um, of the migration across the Mediterranean in the last uh, few years is going to start to to percolate the way that we think about how assistance is given and um, and what kinds of compromises it has always involved in terms of uh, kind of containment of populations and control of populations. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing a new phenomenon, which is the criminalisation of humanitarian action. We see that in the Mediterranean, and we've seen it on the border between uh, America and. Uh, Mexico, and this is a, a, in a sense a new chapter in humanitarian activities that has that we haven't really seen uh, at all uh, until now, and first which we haven't seen since the end of the Cold War. Clearly, before the end of the Cold War, there was a lot more restriction in terms of who could provide assistance where and under what circumstances. So these kind of restrictions on humanitarian workers are also part of the discussion about how um, humanitarian humanitarian action takes place. So this, similar to the International Development Course, has the core module of the, the humanitarian principles and practice, followed by two guided options within the development studies department or in nearby departments that deal with development related issues. One elective module, which is um, freely chosen from across uh, any of the modules that are offered uh, in SOAS, and then the gestation uh, in, in development studies. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for your questions. If there are any more questions, do feel free to ask them now and I'll do my best to respond to anything that arises. Okay, yeah, that's a great question. Um, with the program, you get access to library resources. So SOAS has a, a famed library here in London. It's For those who are not in London, I'd like to just mention it. it's about 35 degrees today. So we're, expect, we're experiencing a really lovely bit of summer. Anybody who can come to London has full access to the SOAS library. So if you are kind of nearby or are able to make that journey, then that's something that is a good idea to do just for your kind of um, study life, you know, to experience the library and what it's like. But the entire program can be uh, taken without any journeys to London or any use of the resources that we have in London. Um, so academic journals, now, uh, almost all academic journals now are, are published online. I think probably we can say all. 
and all of the resources that you will need, all of the core readings and the additional readings are available uh, as in electronic form. So you'll either be able to download them from the site or you'll be able to access the SOAS library um, database through through the, the interactive uh, module page. So all of the readings can be gained uh, remotely. Oh, are you able to take a look at the learning environment? I, I don't think there's any way of doing that, unfortunately. Um, there's a lot of universities that use it or something similar. So if you take an, an undergraduate course in the last probably 10 years, you will have had some kind of experience of the online um, virtual learning environment. It's not too dissimilar from, what can we say? I mean, it's like the internet. You press buttons. Uh, I mean, it's like... Facebook or eBay or something, which is that it's not really like those. I'll, I'll, I'll describe it as best I can. So each week you have a little paragraph about what the subject of the of the top the, sorry the, the topic of the week is, followed by um, the key readings. There may be a little video, there may be something interactive, a little quiz or something, um, and it's on the basis of those readings that the discussion uh, is generated and takes place. Um, so I think this links to another question that someone was asking. Oh no, uh, the in, in, uh, sorry. So the virtual learning environment gives you all of the resources that you need, including contact with the tutor uh, and contact with your colleagues. So there, there is uh, an interface there where you're able to carry on the discussion in your own time of the of the um, modules. Sorry, of the of the readings, and each week builds up. Um, Kind of over the t over the course of the module uh, to provide uh, complementary theoretical understanding, analytical understanding that will lead to to the creation of your essay, which takes place at the end of the, the, the term, and that essay also is submitted through the portal. So basically, once you have access to the virtual learning environment, you have access to all of the um, kind of background material, including the description of the topic all of the readings, uh, the discussion forum, any quizzes, videos, additional uh, material that is involved for that week, and it gives you the portal to hand back at the end of the term. Is there an in-person optional orientation at the beginning of the school year? There's no, um, there's no in-person um, kind of uh, orientation. What there is, is uh, there's an, a series of e, a series of e activities uh, when you are encouraged to get to know each other within the cohort because obviously if you're talking with people kind of across the world at different times and different time zones at different stages in their professional development it's nice to know sort of more or less who they are so there's a little kind of get to know you session at the beginning of each module uh, where you'll be invited to uh, kind of say who you are, where you live, what your favorite restaurant is, and then people say, oh, I haven't been to Lagos, so I want to go to that restaurant next time I go there, uh, and start to build up some rapport there. But again, all of it takes place on the li or online through the virtual learning environment, and all takes place um, in that, that one space. Uh, where can we find the module? So there is an outline of the module. If you go to the uh, SOAS uh, webpage and look for the distance learning programs uh, under the tab there's a tab that says structure I think the module is under the, the structure uh, for the international uh, development it's called the political economy and sociology of development for the humanitarian action it's called humanitarian principles and practice and you'll see that basically will be presented pretty much what I've uh, talked about today in terms of the areas of study um, and the different uh, themes that go through those areas of study we've put quite a lot of um, if we've put quite a lot of information online. If there's anything that you feel will be helpful that is not there, please do drop me an email and I'll make sure that that goes out. We've got um, some questions and answers uh, there. We've got the structure, we've got um, the requirement, entry requirements, costing, whatever else is all uh, on the SOAS webpage under. You can go either to the Development Studies Department and then navigate through from there, or you can go straight to the, the front page. There's a, there's a, part of the page that says distance learning and that will take you straight through to the degrees. Does this program parallel in-person course? Are the online modules asynchronous or is there scheduled meetings? So these programs don't um, don't parallel don't have parallels on campus. 
although there are versions of Donkers that are at least similar in their content. I think the major difference is the mode of um, mode of delivery. So, the, as I said, the International Development Program draws on the reputation that we have in the Development Studies Department and, and the Development Studies degree that we've been teaching for at least like 15 or 20 years. Um, that's not to say that it's exactly the same because the structure of the on-campus program is a little bit different. There are two core modules, there are four elective modules. Uh, and it's um, and then a dissertation as well. So the, the the delivery and that's taught over two ten week terms. So so the the delivery is kind of cut in a different way, and is is differently presented in terms of the themes and the lectures. The humanitarian action doesn't have an on campus version at all, although we're working to provide one next year. Um, so that will have something similar to the humanitarian action, but it will be called humanitarianism, aid and conflict, and will draw not only on the humanitarian work that is done across SOAS, but also on our violence, conflict and development on campus master's program, which has also got a long standing reputation now for I think 10, or is it 20 years? 20 years it is. Um, so there are, I mean, clearly we're the same, we're the same faculty, we're the same people, we have the same research interests and teaching interests, uh, but we are providing something quite specific when we are making these online uh, versions. And as I said, I think the, the kind of professional development, prepare, prepare, preparation to work in uh, development organizations or humanitarian organizations is more accentuated uh, and purposeful in the online programs because we're aware that people are continuing their professional degree. Many of them have already got several years of professional experience behind them. Whereas many of the students who come on campus are, are pretty much at the start of their professional career uh, and don't have such a lot of, excuse me, professional experience that they can bring to the table. So um, just before I missed that question, the, are the online modules asynchronous or are there scheduled meetings? They're asynchronous, so you come to the discussion when you need to come to the discussion. That's as much a practicality issue as anything else. Um, one of the joys of, of online is that we have people literally from all over the world um, and it doesn't make sense to have a, a specific time zone because that will obviously be three o'clock in the morning for some people and, and two o'clock in the afternoon for others. So it's asynchronous and you come to it when you need to. Are there different entry points to the program uh, that is commencing study in September or January or July? So there are two entry moments. Uh, one is in October, so we'll be launching the first cohort in October. Um, and the second is in April. So that means that the, the core modules will run twice a year uh, and people come in when it's right for them to come in. And I think that flexibility, that's speaking to the idea of flexibility and accessibility as well because not everybody has a schedule that allows them to come in in October. So yes, October is one and April is the other. Is there an official web on the online session? How do we uh, get connected to? So yeah, the official website of the um, of the online program is the soas.ac.uk. If you go there and navigate to distance learning, you'll find both of these programs that I've been um, describing today. Are there career development resources available to students in the program to help pair students with career job opportunities? So I think the the main a uh, resource that you have there is the, the strength of the cohort. We have a careers service in SOAS. Uh, as SOAS students, you would uh, be able to avail yourself of that careers service. Um, but I think given that uh, you're likely to have in your cohort 14 people who are already working in uh, development or development uh, um, type organizations, humanitarian organizations, We'll have a, a fantastic network within the cohort of people who will have networks of friends and, and colleagues that will be able to help each other out. And I think one of the key things about it being online and that people continue with their uh, their career while studying is that they will be able to help each other out with contacts uh, and uh, opportunities. Okay, um, if there are any other questions, then I'm willing to ask, answer them. Dan's typing. Um, if not, Oh, I'll just put my email down here. I assume you can all see each other's, or at least in mine. Uh, you can find me online. 
my name is Zoe Married. I think there's only one in the world. Um, there's only only one at SOAS. If you have other questions about the programs, please feel very free to, to email me uh, and I'll get back to you. If we need to have a phone chat, we can do that as well, Skype. Uh, that is all fine. Funding opportunities and scholarships. Scholarships uh, are all dealt with on the SOAS uh, scholarships page. Those come up at various moments through the year. That's not something that we in the department have control over. Um, but there are certainly um, various forms of funding, that, uh, various sources of funding that exist uh, that be able to, to consult with the scholarships page there. So thank you very much for, for taking part in the, the discussion. Thanks particularly to the people who put in questions there. I think all of those were things that I would have mentioned and it was great to get the, the prompt. So thank you for those. Uh, and as I said, I do feel free to um, get in touch by email or by phone. Uh, and I'll do all I can to answer any questions that arise.